in anthology your host michael on a tuesday here i was about to say monday but yesterday was monday we had memorial day it feels like a monday though on a tuesday and we're going over climate change specifically catholics and climate change two opposing views with anthony annette and also trent horn gentlemen welcome to the show how are y'all good thanks michael yeah Great to have you. Good, Michael. Trent? Thanks for having me. Yeah. And I, what I want you all to do is each of you to introduce yourselves, beginning with you, Anthony. Uh, tell us just a little bit about yourself. Then, Trent, you'll tell us a little bit about yourself as well. And then after that, we're going to have seven-minute exc explanations from each one of you, starting with uh, Anthony, I suppose. And then, Trent, you'll just kind of go over your position and how you believe it differs from the other. Uh, we'll do that for about seven minutes each. After that, we're going to have a... Uh, moderated dialogue, followed by audience Q&A. So y'all hold off on questions until I prompt you in the chat uh, to put your questions there. And then finally, we'll have some closing thoughts. So Anthony, beginning with you, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me here. It's a, it's a great pleasure. Uh, my name is Tony Annette. I am currently a visiting scholar at the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. I am an economist by training. I spent two decades at the International Monetary Fund, including as speechwriter to the managing director. And now I work independently. I have uh, written a book called Catholicomics, How Catholic Tradition Can Create a More Just Economy. So that's the nutshell version of where I come from. Excellent. And you, Trent? Well, my name is Trent Horn. I'm an apologist for Catholic Answers. I'm author of nine books, and I host a podcast called The Council of Trent. And yeah, I just want to explain and defend the Catholic faith. I also enjoy discussing where Catholicism intersects with modern culture, and that would include the topic of today's dialogue. Wonderful. Anthony, let's begin with you. Seven minutes. Just kind of explain to us your position and how you believe it differs with Trent's. Sure. Thanks, Michael. Mm -hmm. uh, we're here to talk about uh, the Catholic approach to climate change, and that immediately takes us to Laudato Si, which is Pope Francis's extremely important 2015 in social encyclical. Um, I would argue that this is possibly one of the most important social encyclicals ever written. Um, it's basically the rerum novarum of its day, because if you remember, in the 1890s, what Rerum Novarum did is look at the new things of the Industrial Revolution and apply kind of timeless Catholic moral principles to these new things in a very profound and prophetic way. In the same manner, Pope Francis takes the new things of today, of the 21st century, and these are the challenges of sustainable development the very pressing environmental crisis, which overlaps with the social and economic crisis that we face. He talks about the joint social and environmental crises. Now, what is this environmental crisis? Um, I would argue that we are trespassing some vital planetary boundaries. And those boundaries are nine. They include things like climate change, ocean acidification, the overuse of fresh water resources, land use changes, mainly deforestation, the interference with the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles caused by fertilizers, ozone depletion, chemical pollution, airborne pollution, which kills 7 million people a year, and the loss of profound loss of biodiversity. In each of these planetary boundaries, because of human activity, the footprint of humanity is disrupting vital uh, cycles of biology, chemistry, and physics. We are leaving behind the Holocene, that 10,000-year period of balance, stability, fecundity, climate stability, and human flourishing. And we're entering the Anthropocene, the first ever geological period of the earth, which is caused by human activity, which is more unknown, more hostile and harsher. Now, the most important of these planetary boundaries is, I think, climate change. And this is affirmed by Laudato Si, which recognizes the solid scientific consensus that the climate is warming 
due to the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere caused by the burning of fossil fuels. Now, if we look at the long-term picture, there is a clear relationship between the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and global temperatures. Um, that um, concentration ranged between 150 and 300 parts per million over the last 800,000 years, but we're now at over 420 parts per million. That's higher than it's ever been in the past 3 million years, which is a cause of very deep concern. Now, luckily, the global um, governance has come together to agree that they would limit uh, this warming, this climate change to 1.5 degrees over pre-industrial levels or at most 2 degrees Celsius. Now, what does that mean? That basically means net zero carbon emissions by mid-century. And we do this by electrifying everything and by generating all that electricity from carbon-free energy. This is a challenge like we have never faced before in human history. We are not on track. Um, if countries implement all their plans, the best estimates suggest we will warm by around 2.5 to 2.8 degrees. If they don't implement their plans, we're talking three degrees or more, which would be catastrophic. Now, we're already seeing the effects of climate change. This is not some hypothetical future. This is today. The 10 hottest years on record have occurred since 2010. We're looking at sea level rise, droughts, floods, fires, severe weather events. Um, we're seeing effects of agriculture and animal husbandry in Africa. Last year, we saw one third of Pakistan underwater. And of course, as Pope Francis says very clearly, it is the poor that are on the front lines of climate change. The World Bank suggests that by 2030, 100 million people could be pushed into extreme poverty because of climate change. Um, and as we know, the bottom 3 billion people of the world account for only 5 to 6 percent of the carbon emissions in the atmosphere. 85 percent of those emissions come from the richest 2.5 billion people. This is a rich country and a rich person problem. Now, we see great um, jeopardy in the years ahead. Uh, the Lancet claims that climate change is the greatest global health challenge of the century from extreme heat, droughts, flooding, food insecurity, disease, respiratory health, mental health, and suicides. Um, we see profound economic costs. Of course, these are hard to estimate, but one influential study suggests that climate change could reduce global output by 23% by mid-century. We shall see much greater population displacement. The International Organization of Migration suggests 200 million climate refugees by 2050, and 1.5 billion people could live in regions that become rapidly inhospitable. We should see greater violence, conflict, war, and social societal breakdown. We already see this with the Syrian civil war, which was when Syria suffered the worst drought in recorded history between 26 and 2010. Um, Cardinal Bo from Myanmar had a very profound quote about this. He said, climate change is like a criminal genocide of the rich against the poor. That's very, very strong language, but I think it kind of meets the challenge of what we face. Now, luckily, decarbonization is feasible. We have seen in the last decade alone amazing technological advances in wind, solar, battery storage, EVs, power grids, and efficient building design. Wind and solar is now the cheapest form of energy. The cost of, um, oh, I will, I'll stop soon, the cost of uh, 
solving climate change is about $1 trillion a year, which is 1% of global GDP. Now, 10 years ago, we were on a much more worrying path. But thanks to technological advance, we actually now have a chance to solve climate change and put humanity on a much more secure footing and solve the profound socio-environmental crisis as laid out so clearly by Pope Francis in his prophetic encyclical, Laudato Si. So I'll stop there because I think I ran over. So thanks. A That's lot. okay. Tony, thank you so much for that. That was an excellent opening. And yeah, Trent, if you want to go a little bit over seven minutes, that, that's perfectly fine. Well, I think I should be fine. Let me bring up my presentation here. Mm -hmm. Sure. I should have that. And I have that. Okay, that's up. I don't see it yet. Yeah, I just I just brought it up. Let's see. It. it should be in the window. <clears throat> okay, here we go. All right. Uh, Michael, can you see me and see my presentation? I, I can. And it's just going to be just you <laughs> and your presentation on the screen. We're going to back up. All right. Sounds good. All right. Well, thanks, Michael, for hosting this. And Tony, thank you so much for being willing to dialogue with me about this. So Here's my position. Uh, since the church can only bind the faithful to believe in matters related to faith and morals, the church has no specific teaching on scientific issues like the rate of global warming and the nature of its causes. Catholics are free to disagree about that. And while the church can bind the faithful on the moral law, the correct way to respond to climate change relies on assumptions about predictive climate models that are not a part of the church's teaching authority. So, for example, when Laudato Si says we must move away immediately from fossil fuels, this represents a prudential judgment that should be given consideration, but does not require religious submission. The Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith says that when it comes to the questions of interventions in the prudential order, it could happen that some magisterial documents might not be free from all deficiency deficiencies. Bishops and their advisors have not always taken into immediate consideration every aspect or the entire complexity of a question. For example, Laudato Si cautiously says global warming has been accompanied, quote, it would appear by an increase of extreme weather events. Note the qualifying language. But it only appears this way because of media coverage spurred by alarmists. In fact, here, here are the facts. In the past 170 years, there has been no increase in the frequency or strength of North Atlantic hurricanes. One study showed that global cyclones have actually decreased due to global warming. In the past 70 years, there's been no increase in American tornadoes. Deaths from floods have not increased as fossil fuel consumption has increased. And there's been no increase in droughts, uh, despite the increase in carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions. Wildfires and heat waves in the United States have also not increased in the past century. However, globally, in the past 20 years, there have been 650,000 fewer cold-related deaths, which means that temperature deaths overall have decreased, even though greenhouse gas emissions have increased. Remember, climate is not a friendly thing. We make dangerous with fossil fuels. Until a few decades ago, climate was the dangerous thing. But fossil fuels made it safe by allowing us to manage floods, reinforce heat and cool buildings, and reliably transport and store food and medicine, at least in the developed world. Pope Francis said the goal of Laudato Si was to dialogue on these issues. And part of dialogue involves listening to those who disagree. So consider these points. Uh, So-called renewable energy, it's not actually that renewable. It relies on limited resources. For example, to power windmills and solar panels, you need rare earth metals like lithium. You have to mine it in China, which is a very uh, dirty and harmful process to the people who live there. It also involves human rights abuses like slave labor in China and the Congo. Uh, as for its cheapness, that might not be that way forever. Lithium prices have skyrocketed recently. Also, when Tony says solar and wind are cheaper, that's like saying a trailer is cheaper than a tractor. Yeah, it is, but it can't get the job done by itself. There is no country that just uses wind and solar. You have to have a reliable backup because the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. Uh, Britain figured this out in 2018 when they had a wind drought and their wind energy plummeted. That's why only five countries in the world get more than 20% of their energy from wind and no country, gets no country on earth gets more than 20% of its energy from solar. Uh, 
And I found this interesting on, on Tony's Twitter. He said that the energy transition is unstoppable. And he tweeted this from Max Roser. And it's talking about share of electricity from low carbon, Sweden at 98%, France at 88%. And it looks impressive if you think that most of this is coming from solar and wind, uh, but it's not. 75% of French power comes from nuclear. And in Sweden, 74% of their power comes from nuclear and dams. Only 1% of Sweden's power comes from solar energy. But 3 billion people around the world don't have access to clean cooking fuel. They don't have fossil fuels, so they have to cook with animal dung. 760 million people around the world have no access to electricity. They get lung cancer from burning dung to cook food. Uh, they watch their babies die in hospitals that have no electricity to power incubators, or the incubators turn off because their solar panels are unreliable. That's why Laudato Si says, for poor countries, the priorities must be to eliminate extreme poverty and to promote the social development of their people. But it's no coincidence that the richest countries on earth use the most fossil fuels and the poorest countries on earth have the least fossil fuels. Uh, how can we expect these poor undeveloped countries to ever prosper and promote human flourishing if we don't allow them to use fossil fuels that even developed countries still need? Germany, in fact, is firing up its coal powered plants because it closed their nuclear plants and solar and wind are not enough to keep the lights on and the furnaces running. When climate alarmist solutions are implemented, it ends up hurting the poor. For example, when Sri Lanka banned fertilizer in order to combat climate change, they ended up with massive food insecurity and the people revolted. Laudato Si even admits that, quote, until greater progress is made in developing widely accessible sources of renewable energy, it is legitimate to choose the less harmful alternative or to find short term solutions. The only thing stopping us from helping the poor get energy are climate alarmists with doomsday predictions that have often failed to materialize. For example, back in the 1960s, uh, environmentalists promoted mass sterilizations, involuntary sterilizations, because they believed the world could not have enough food supply to feed everyone. But today, there are twice as many people as there were in the 1960s, and we live in the least famine-prone period in history. 20 years ago, researchers said climate change would cause Britain to be Siberian. Now, it's chilly in London, but it's not Siberia. And the most recent predictive models say that actually the worst case climate scenarios are no longer possible. And when you look at other worst case economic scenarios like ones from Nicholas Stern, he says the worst case scenario is that in the year 2100, people will be slightly less rich, maybe a 20 percent reduction of income. But income is going to increase overall because population will level off and per capita income will increase as a result. Now, here's the thing. What would it cost to like really make the U.S.? If the U.S. ran only, if our country ran only on solar, wind, and battery, how much would that cost? According to this study from Energy Environmental Science, it would cost $23 trillion for batteries, long-distance transmission lines, turbines, solar panels, to in order to power the entire country on solar and wind. $23 trillion. It's insane to spend that kind of money when... We don't even know if that would lower global temperatures at all if other countries don't like China and India don't cooperate to spend twenty three trillion dollars on something like this when that same amount of money could single handedly end global poverty is just absolutely insane to me. Uh, and there's the thing. Most climate scientists don't believe that we can end the climate crisis just by switching to solar and wind. They know that practically it can't be done. So that's why they're promoting a campaign to reduce human standards of living. Uh, according to this article in the Journal of Global Environmental Change, they say that people should be required to live in 600 square foot houses, use 30 gallons of gas a year, wash their clothes only once every two weeks. But don't worry, everybody still gets a cell phone over the age of 10. That's really in the report. Uh, in or so what their proposal to avoid the climate apocalypse is to make all of us live in a post-apocalyptic world to have that li living standard or to have the living standard that people have in rural Ghana in Africa. So to summarize, the church does not have a teaching on the scientific facts related to climate change or on the best method to respond to the issue. People are free to hold a variety of opinions on that. Uh, uh, Catholics have a lot of freedom to determine the best way to protect human beings and care for the environment. So the bottom line, you, you can be a good Catholic and agree with Tony and believe in an urgent solution, you could be a good Catholic and agree with me or agree with people who disagree with Tony and I about climate change. 
you just don't have to agree with the position uh, that he is endorsing. Ultimately, we should give respectful consideration to what the Pope says on climate change. We should follow church teaching and be good stewards of the environment. Uh, but my personal opinion is that we should not give in to climate alarmists who travel the world in jet airplanes, uh, giving advice that ultimately would cause more suffering than it purports to solve. So that would be my deal. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Trent. Okay, so now let's move on to our second portion here, and that is a moderated dialogue. So, um, you know, it's a free-flowing discussion here, so y'all are welcome to go back and forth and ask each other questions. And uh, if you want to go ahead and start, um, I, I don't know if one of y'all has a question that's just burning in your bosom you have to ask and initiate. Go ahead. Oh, well, I guess I have a, I have a question that, Tony, when you were – you said that there would be, if we if temperature levels rise above like 1.5 degrees Celsius, there would be catastrophe. What did you mean by that? What specifically would the world, what kind of living standard would we have? What would the world look like? Well, for example, we could say estimates suggest that for every degree of warming, crop yields decline by 10%. That would devastate Africa. We're, we're already seeing... Africa being devastated. We're seeing Lake Chad drying up. We're seeing increasing conflict between pastoralists and farmers uh, in Nigeria and Chad. Um, if you watch the beautiful movie produced by the Laudato Si movement, The Letter, uh, it describes very movingly the plight of some Africans who are affected by a changing climate and how they basically no longer have the ability to eke out a living on the land. So we're seeing that. Um, we will see a lot in places like Bangladesh, low-lying countries. We're going to see a lot more floods, uh, devastating floods in low-lying areas. We could see small island economies disappearing. Remember that... So, well, Tony, so like small... The, Vat the Vatican agreed with the 1.5 degree... A warming limit because it wanted to express solidarity with the small Pacific has, islands. Yeah. Has the Vatican submitted their proposal? So they just ratified the Paris Accord in 2022. Have they submitted their climate plan yet? That I don't know. I wouldn't imagine that. that would they, they actually have not submitted their climate yeah. plan. So and I think that's kind of interesting. The Vatican has said that, but they're now being discussed as they, they actually haven't bothered to submit the plan. They're supposed to submit on time. Well, you, you talked about flooding and like island nations. Are you familiar with the prediction back in like 1990 that the Maldives would be underwater by now? The Maldives could well be underwater very soon. Yeah. But there were predictions back in the 90s it'd be underwater today, and obviously that hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened yet, but it's close to happening, I think. When, when would that happen? I, I have no idea. You, have, you made a point about modeling. I right. think we need to get something very clear, that the relationship between carbon emissions and global temperatures was worked out by Swedish chemist Svante Arrhenius in the 1890s using pen and paper to an amazing degree of accuracy. This has nothing to do with climate models. This is just basic science. And um, yeah. But it's a models trying to predict the future. The models are trying to account for as many possibilities and complexities as possible. Yes. Did the models fail to predict uh, that warming would not increase from 1996 to 2012? You cannot look at warming over such a short period of time because with high frequency data, you are, in, you are interrupted by things like El Nino's, which basically pollute high frequency data. You have to look at it over the longer term. And if you look at it over the longer term, you will see very, very clear warming over the second half of the 20th century and the first part of the 21st century, especially if you look over the baseline, say, between the late 19th century, which is really, really, really what you want to look at. So I don't, you shouldn't be going into these. I know you're not a denialist, but when you quote things like that, that gets really into kind of denialist arguments, because this is something that I've seen into the entities like the Heartland Institute promote. And I don't know if you know, but when I attended a Vatican meeting in 2015 on climate change, the Heartland Institute tried to sabotage that by accosting Ban Ki-moon. So there are some very bad actors here on that side of the, 
on, uh, I would say, anti-Catholic actors on that side of the equation. Okay, but my point that I'm just making is that the church obviously has no authority to teach which climate models are correct, and because that's a matter of science. Uh, Michael, if you could bring up my slide that I have here. Uh, for example, what I was referencing here with 2012, so we have here in the Journal of Nature and Climate Change showing the overestimation of global warming over the past 20 years. And in this article, talking about how the rate of warming was less than half of the simulated rate. Uh, in other cases, it was four times smaller than the average simulated trend. So it may be the case. Would you agree then? You can take that down, Michael. Thank you. Um, that people disagree about these models. And because there's disagreement, the moral action, the action that we ought to take going into the future to, uh, let's say one solution would be to be carbon neutral by 2050. Maybe another is carbon neutral by 2080 or 2100. Would you agree that that's a prudential judgment that people are free to make? That's not like a church teaching. Well, it, I mean, this is, this is something I see that seems to be very exclusive to American Catholics. This using of prudential judgment as a kind of hand-waving device to play down certain teachings. And I don't think prudence is a cardinal virtue, as you know, um, which refers to the use of wisdom, the use of practical reason to apply moral principles to concrete circumstances. And I think that when you look at the interplay of faith and reason, when you see carbon emissions at 421 parts per million, which is higher than the last 3 million years. Um, does that mean that temperatures are going to rise by X percent next year or in five years or in 10 years? That's kind of vague, but we are heading for a very scary future. So and that's I not vague, that the future will be scary. It's not vague that the future will be scary, no, okay. unless we take action. And we are, I mean, you made a point that is correct, that in the 2014 IPCC report, uh, the idea of warming uh, in the range of four to six degrees was very much on the cards. Most climate scientists today do not think four to six degrees is on the cards. And that is due to the deployment of renewable technology and the fact that uh, wind, solar, and battery technology, the, the costs have plummeted and um, you're seeing massive deployment uh, of, uh, I don't think people, I mean, you quote America, US a lot, but I don't know if people realize that 40% of American electricity is generated by uh, clean energy. About half of that is nuclear and half of that is renewables. And about two thirds of new energy that's coming online is coming from also coming from clean energy. So that's what I mean by this is real and it's unstoppable. Now, is there a way? Do we have a way to go? Yeah, we do. We need more technological improvement. Mm -hmm. I would like to see more development in carbon capture and sequestration and clean hydrogen and areas like that. I would like to see more thought given to how do you solve aviation? How do you solve steel, cement, and chemicals? All these industries which rely heavily on fossil uh, fuels for which we haven't got adequate solutions yet. Well, here's, well, here's and if you have questions for me, feel free to, to ask, but did um, does Laudato C uh, say that there is a particular year we should reach carbon neutrality or a particular parts per million we should get CO2 to? No, but La what Laudato C basically endorses well La Dr. C was written before the Paris Agreement came out, but it basically it basically said that the agreements up till then and uh, the agreement in, uh, in Rio in 1992, uh, the implementation in 1994 have failed. Laudato C basically says global governance in the area of environmental policy and climate change have dramatically failed and it and Pope Francis prayed for a positive outcome to what were then current negotiations. Now, the Vatican, as you know, endorsed the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, which took place a few months after Laudato Si came out. It, it only ratified it last year in 2022. Yeah, well, that's a bureaucratic thing. As you know, Pope Benedict XVI made the Vatican, I believe the Vatican is carbon neutral 
tiny footprint, but thanks to the solar panels that that, that Benedict the Sixteen uh, installed, uh, people it's, forget that. It's Benedict, not hard to do that of a country oh, that has eight hundred people. Yeah, it's not hard, but at least it's a small. But you 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 keep raising this issue of the Vatican for some reason. It's a small. It's a small country. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, so just to reiterate then, even before and after the Pope has not said we need to reach carbon neutrality globally by a certain year. He hasn't set since he has since the church doesn't say we need to reach it at this year or that year. Maybe people can say, you know what, it's not realistic to get to carbon neutrality in 2050, given the limits of solar and wind. That's something more in 2080 or 2100. Can a Catholic hold that view? Um. I don't think that would be prudent to hold that view, given what we know about the. So no, that's your economy. your prudential judgment. Yeah, it's a prudential judgment. But again, okay. prudential judgment is not a get out of jail free card. Sure. Prudential judgment is basically, you know, clear Catholic, clear Catholic teaching. Um, my question for you is that you mentioned at the start that Catholics are free to disagree. What exactly are they free to disagree about? Do you think that if you I mean, I get on Twitter all the time, I get climate change deniers. Do you think a Catholic is free to deny the existence of climate change? Because I don't think so. Yeah, a Catholic is only obligated to believe what the church teaches in regards to faith and morals. So they have to believe with divine and Catholic faith what the church uh, infallibly teaches or dogmatically teaches. And they have to give the religious submission of mind and will to what the church teaches as doctrine, so which would fall under faith and morals. Uh, but things that are not doctrinal, for example, like scientific truths, uh, Catholics are free to hold uh, many different scientific beliefs, including false ones. For example, a Catholic is free to believe the theory of evolution is false and the world was created 6,000 years ago. Now, I don't think they should hold that belief. I believe in the theory of evolution. But the church doesn't endorse particular scientific theories, and with good reason, because the deposit of faith doesn't include scientific truth. It's truths related to faith and morals. Right. But scientific truth is nonetheless <laughs> truth. And as Pope John Paul II says, truth cannot, con didn't he say truth cannot contradict truth when he was talking about evolution? I would say the same applies to climate change. We know factually what has happened. We know where we stand with uh, current carbon emissions. We know, thanks to our friends Fanti Arrhenius, what that does to global temperatures. We know what global temperatures does to human flourishing. Therefore, if we want to solve this problem, we should implement the Paris <coughs> Agreement. That is a prudential judgment, but as a prudential judgment based on the weight of scientific and economic evidence. And I think if you go against that you are basically opening the door to a future which is i think quite dangerous well uh, can people question that evidence given the data that i've just presented to you that the earth has warmed by i think one degree or 1.5 degrees in the last century and yet we have not seen in that period uh, of d warming by one, one to one, one to two degrees in the past 100 years, climate related deaths have decreased by 98%. So I feel like what you're talking about, since this does not fall under church teaching, a Catholic could hold your view, or they could hold the view that actually there's a lot of human suffering, people in Africa who are dying prematurely, children are dying. And the only the thing that would help them is an increase of fossil fuels. And if we go to carbon neutrality, we're going to be prematurely killing millions of people. And there are climatologists who agree with this, people like David Leggett, Patrick Michaels. So since scientists disagree, I agree with you, like my view. I agree that the, the earth is warming. I agree with that. And I agree that there are a mixture of consequences, positive and negative from warming. But people can disagree about how well we can mitigate and how well we can adapt to that. So shouldn't Catholics be free to debate and say, hey, maybe we can adapt to these changes and we shouldn't abandon people in the developing world who really need fossil fuels right now instead of just going to carbon neutrality? It depends on what you mean by that. I mean, Laudato C does say that you're right. Laudato C does say that the key issue is 
the eradication of global extreme poverty, which still affects 700 million people today. And you're right that about a billion people lack electricity or clean cooking fuels. Um, now, would more fossil fuels in Nigeria materially affect the global situation? Probably not. But my question to you is, why would they want to do that, given what we know about renewable technology today and given that the sun shines quite well in Nigeria? Um, Except at night. Well, we have that's what batteries are for. Uh, wind and solar can solve a lot of the problems. I disagree with you that we are not at a technologically advanced state to develop clean energy at the moment. I think we are very close to that. Mm -hmm. So I think just like you saw in African countries, they leapfrogged telecommunications technology to go straight from uh, landlines to um, cell phones. They can they can just as easily leapfrog fossil fuels and go straight to renewable technology. Uh, the problem is the cost. Uh, like everything else in low-income countries, they face a poverty trap uh, because it's too expensive to ramp up spending to eradicate poverty, boost health, education, clean water and sanitation, clean energy, which is where global solidarity comes in. And Laudato Si is also very clear that we need global solidarity. We need rich countries to lend a helping hand to poor countries. You're right to say that that is a, a key and urgent priority, I would, yeah. So your view is that even though the most advanced countries on earth, like the United States and Germany, are unable to make the majority of their power wind and solar, that these developing countries, some of them still using 19th century technology in Africa, they'll be able to do what Germany and the US can't. Well, Germany and the U.S. are making are making great progress towards that. I mean, as you know from the, the figure you put up from from my tweet, um, something like um, Austria and Sweden are generating close to eighty percent of electricity consumption from renewables right now. No, it, um, seventy in Sweden, seventy four percent of that comes from dams and nuclear. And Sweden, Tony, would you agree? Would Right. OK, then would you agree with this, that if we're going to reach carbon neutrality, this should be our motto. Solar and wind have their place, but nuclear and hydroelectric should be our primary avenues. I wouldn't say primary, but I actually don't have a problem with nuclear because I think fourth generation nuclear is pretty safe and pretty efficient. The only problem with nuclear is it's extremely expensive to build and it's a fairly expensive form of power. So again, why would you want to do that when you have cheap wind and solar? Now, I think Germany made a fundamental error in prematurely shutting down its nuclear plants. That was ridiculous. Um, and I think, you know, there is a role to play where you have nuclear power, by all means, keep using that nuclear power. If you want to build nuclear power and you, you think that that's the way, that's the best way to efficiently spend your money, why not? Wouldn't be my choice, but why not? Yeah, it's clean. It's definitely clean and it's definitely safe. Well, actually, so Michael, if you could bring up a slide here for you to see, um, I could show you why I'm skeptical about wind and solar primarily being able to do this because you're talking about how they're cheaper, but you also have to factor in, yeah, they're cheaper. Wind and solar are cheaper because they're always accessories to a grid that has something like a natural gas backup that is reliable uh, because when you wind and solar fail, you must have something to, to take care of the backup. Uh, so when we look at land use, for example, uh, the same amount of power that one nuclear plant can do requires 45 square miles of solar panels. That's the size of the city of Paris. And it requires 300 square miles of wind turbines, uh, which can be bad for birds and bad for the environment. Uh, that if you were and if you were to cover uh, solar for the, you know, the entire U.S., this is from Vaclav Smil. He has a great book on energy density because it's not just the, these. If you wanted it just wind and solar, because it's not fair to compare the solar and wind and say, oh, well, they're cheaper. Yeah, because they're supplementing what natural gas, coal and nuclear and hydroelectric do. If you tried to just make it um, 
using the batteries, like you say, there's two problems with the batteries. Uh, one, so these are this is the world's largest lithium ion battery facility. It's in Escondido, California, actually. If you visit Gavik Answers in San Diego, you can go up and see the lithium ion batteries here. It's a huge uh, field, but this can only power 20,000 homes for four hours in Escondido. Y you would have to cover one third of the US with batteries and solar panels, one third of the country space to be able to use just solar. So I, I do think that when you're trying to say, so with the batteries, you either have a lithium ion or the battery that's used is a water battery. You basically, you do solar, then you, the surplus energy, you pump up water in a reservoir and you run it through a dam during peak hours. You pump the water at three in the morning and you run the water at 5 p.m. In, in the evening, uh, which doesn't work in places if it's not mountainous and you don't have reservoirs. So if you can see where, where I'm coming from, you can bring that down, Michael. Um, why I'm really skeptical, like, why, that's why it doesn't make sense to me. And like I said, Catholics can hold your view. I think it's incorrect or mine. But so is your view to get to carbon neutrality, we should do solar and energy primarily and nuclear has its place, the opposite of what I said? Yeah, I think, you know, like I said, I think you should do all, all, on the, all clean zero carbon energy should be on the table. And that includes nuclear. Okay. Uh, I'm skeptic of nuclear based on the cost. But, you know, if that's the, your prudential choice mm. of a government that wants to support the common good, then that's fine. That's legitimate. Yeah. I would um, say also the cost is the forward capital deals with discounting rates that I believe are really high. That will take us way too far afield to uh, that yeah, gets yeah, into yeah, technical yeah. economics. In any case, um, what else did I have? Well, we talked a lot about... Um, the you know about addressing this i think you know we, you and i both agree we have different views we both agree uh climate change has negative consequences it's something to address i think we disagree though about the urgency and, and what is required um because like some of the things you brought up um you said like ocean acidification um how acidified has the ocean become in the past 100 years Oh, I, I, I don't have the data in front of me, but very acidified. Um, yes, I mean, the, cor we're, we're, we're the, the coral reefs, even at 1.5 degrees temperature, the coral reefs are at risk, uh, which is a, cr a crucial aspect of biodiversity in the oceans. Yeah, I think there's been something like a 20 to 30% increase in ocean acidification. Well, here, Michael, you can bring up my screen here. There has been, you could call it a 30% increase, but also what has happened is you could describe it this way, pH levels, so acidic, you know, acidic or alkaline, 7.0 is neutral. In the past 100 years, we've gone from 8.2 to 8.1. So I feel like even the language we use, there's a lot of disagreement about what are the long-term effects of this. Like you could call it acidification, or you could call it the oceans are just becoming more neutral from 8.2 to 8.1. And there's parts of the world in the Bering Sea where we fish a lot of cod where it's 7.7. It's .7. And there's studies showing that coral reefs don't have a tipping point when they're exposed um, to more CO2. So I guess you know, you're saying, well, there could be these bad things. But we also have other studies showing, like when you mentioned like Africa, for example, and loss of trees, things like that. With CO2, it's also it's also good for trees, right? Like we, we have more trees now than we have ever had in the past 35 years. Slash and slash and burn in South America has led to dis deforestation. But there's other policies we can do to mitigate that. So uh, my point in, in bringing that up would just be, once again, I think that the data can be interpreted in different ways about the severity. Like you use words like catastrophic. I would not use that word. And so that's going to influence the choices we make to respond. So you can take that down, Michael. Yeah, I think, you know, talking about biodiversity in the, the great, what Pope Francis calls the lungs of the planet, the Amazon, the Congo Basin, and the Indonesian archipelago, um, at around 2.5 to 3 degree warming, uh, they no longer become carbon sinks. And this is where you get kind of a multiplier effect. My worry when I use the term catastrophic is you, once you reach a certain tipping point, you get multiplier effects and you get, and some of these are kind of even unknown. They haven't been properly mapped out yet. So that's what kind of worries me once we get uh, into this kind of levels. Um, again, I think it's just, and maybe we don't agree, disagree as much as, as we 
possibly thought we did. Um, but I think that, you know, we should aim for carbon neutrality by 2050. Um, do we have a chance at staying to 1.5 degrees as, as suggested by the Paris Agreement? Probably not at this point, but we certainly should do as much as, much as we can to... to so going so you wouldn't support, for example, in India or interior Africa, uh, building cheap coal or oil plants so that people could to finally have energy. Like for example, if you allowed oil companies to explore and process oil in interior Africa, like they do in Uganda, you could get a lot of energy immediately to people instead of them burning dung and charcoal in their homes. You, would you be in favor of doing that at least as a short-term measure? Well, it's hard to say that that's a short-term measure because if you're building a coal plant or an oil refinery, you're locking in for 40 or 50 years. So it's hard to know that. Um, so the climate math of the, of the Paris Agreement suggests that about 80% of coal, oil, and gas reserves need to stay in the ground. Uh, in 2018, when Pope Francis addressed the oil company executives, he made this very point. He basically said, you guys need to shift towards renewable energy, and you, most of your reserves need to stay in the ground. The problem with that well, is why do the reserves need to stay in the ground? Because if you burn them, you you get temperatures that go beyond the agreed limits. This is the climate math. Um, that's about twenty trillion dollars of lost profits, and these companies. This is why these companies are resisting it. Pope Francis is very very clear about what's going on here about the economic um, issues at stake. He says. There are too many special interests who manipulate information so that their own plans will not be affected. He said that there are too many people concerned with masking the problems and concealing the symptoms. So these are the kind of issues we need to deal with when we're talking about climate change, that we're facing a huge behemoth of corporate power, um, very, very strong vested interests, some of the wealthiest country uh, companies in the world are fossil fuel companies so this is another another dimension which we didn't really talk about but we should and uh, that, that this is kind of what we're up against well, aren't some of the They're largest people. companies in the world also the ones that produce rare earth metals and so in order to go to wind and solar we have to mine in china for example uh which holds the majority of these things or we have to mine in the Congo, which uses slave labor. So aren't we also in choosing this path, doing things that are environmentally destructive? Well, we need to clean up the supply chain for sure. What's going on in the mining in the Congo is an absolute disgrace. And Pope Francis was very, very clear about that when he went to Congo, when he basically says, you know, uh, strong economic interests, get your hands off Africa. So, yes, we need to clean that up. Um, but, you know, I would argue that from a cost benefit analysis, uh, the choice of going all in with more fossil fuels leads to far greater environmental harms than going in with lithium, cobalt or nickel, nickel mining. But you're right. We definitely need to clean up the, uh, the supply chains, uh, especially in Africa out there, which I think is a moral travesty. I guess um, another question I would have is, because obviously what we're doing is we're talking about causing harm now and failing to alleviate harm. So like if we don't build a coal or oil powered power plant in Africa, it allows people to still suffer extreme amounts of harm that most of the world forgets about and takes for granted when you turn on water or turn on an electric light. Uh, or if we were to do carbon neutrality in the U.S. and just by 2050, coal and oil plants were shut down here in the US and we didn't have wind or solar to pick them up, that would cause a lot of harm in the US, I would imagine, if you couldn't turn on your light or or pump your water. So it's, you know, there's harms that will cause now with some climate policies to alleviate harms in the future. So like my question hypothetically would be this, would you agree it does not make sense, for example, to enact an economic policy now that causes a great depression? if the effect of it is to prevent a less serious great recession 80 years from now, for example. Well, speaking of the great, you mentioned Nicholas Stern's work, the Stern Review. 
Right. And what you didn't mention was Nicola Stern basically said that the cost of climate change would exceed the Great Depression and the two world wars combined. Mm -hmm. Now, that was written in 2006, so maybe it's not so catastrophic today. But even so, um, I um, you know, I've some of the economic costs that I mentioned, one recent study says that um, it, climate on not addressing climate change could cost $1.2 trillion a year. That's over 1% of global GDP. Or, re, or another study says it could reduce global output by a quarter, by 2100. So would that justify... That these, these, these economic magnitudes of not addressing climate change dwarf anything... Uh, from the kind of cost that you're talking about. Right. But would it make sense if it, let's say it did cost climate change cost a trillion dollars a year from now to 2050. So that'd be $27 trillion. It wouldn't make sense then. Let's say it costs $50 trillion to get to carbon neutrality. In that case, it wouldn't make sense. The solution would be worse than the problem you're trying to solve. But that's not, it wouldn't, it doesn't cost $50 trillion. It costs about about a trillion dollars a year for between now and 2050 as well I can as well I can imagine yeah to get to to get to carbon neutrality yeah what's hard for me it's it's really hard for me those kinds of predictions of how much it'll cost like I lived in California and they told us it was only going to cost 10 million dollars to build a high-speed train from LA to San Francisco and now it's going to cost like a hundred billion dollars uh, so that's, where I'm skeptical yeah no no that's Let's have, yeah, we can get it. This is, this is a huge issue. This is a huge issue in the U.S. In the U.S., you have this bizarre thing where you can use, where you have nimbyism to stop environmental projects. You have yeah. ridiculous environmental reviews that are used against environmental projects. So this is, in my view, if you ask me what is the biggest problem in the U.S. to get to carbon neutrality, I would say it's not even the vested interests of oil and gas. It's not even the political momentum. It's not even the denialists. It's the nimbyists. You have to build a massive amount of transmission lines. I, and I and I agree with money. Tony. I actually agree with you. Have you ever heard of the with wind turbines, the Starbucks rule? No. The rule is that wind turbine companies don't bother to build wind turbines within 30 miles of a Starbucks because they, people will protest too much about having them there. This is the problem. And you have rich people living on Cape Cod who don't want their views obstructed by windmills. These are problems. This is nimbyism. Yeah. So I think we agree on that. Yeah, we, we agree. Uh, so I guess another thing, like, because it's, you know, it is so interesting that, with you and I talking about this, like there's going to be people watching this who will say, I'm a total idiot. Global warming's a scam, blah, 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 blah. I do believe in global warming. I believe there's going to be negative consequences. I do think increased global temperatures can exacerbate some things. I do not believe they're the primary cause of a lot of these disasters. The IPCC doesn't think that either. Um, but I do think that there's um, elements where we can, uh, where, where we should intervene in that. Uh, the question though is, is how much? Because I think we should do something, but what I really worry about, and I'm glad you say 2050, because there's some people who are saying carbon neutrality by like 2030, which is, which cannot, that's, that's impossible. That yeah. cannot be done. But if we, I guess, I think you can appreciate this. If there's a problem and we set an unrealistic solution or goal and we fail to reach it, um, it can be very demoralizing to people. Like, I think, for example, like to reach, even to reach carbon neutrality by 2050, like when you ask people, is climate change a problem? They'll say yes in polls in the U.S., but then when you ask them, how much are you willing to spend to combat climate change? 34% of people won't spend more than $100 a year. So it's it's yeah. like if people will not, it would, in order to reach like carbon neutrality in the US in 2050, it'd be a massive investment of GDP and taxes, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, it would be a definite ramping up. Um... It's not just fossil fuels, right? We'd also have to replace all cars, what, 100 million cars yeah. replaced with yes. EVs? Yes. Well, you, you could do that by basically saying only EVs can be sold after 2030 or 2035, as many European countries are saying. Um, but, you know, these old cars will be on the road for decades still, and there's nothing we can do about that. You think that might be 
kind of hard on some people if, uh, like, especially the poor, I feel like some of these policies would be kind of regressive. Like if it's 2035 and you're a poor person and your, your car breaks down, EVs usually cost ten to fifteen thousand dollars more new. Finding a used car, prices will go up. So it seems like a pretty regressive. And I guess for me, like like a policy like we're going to ban new gas cars after twenty thirty five. I mean, government maybe they have the right to do that. I don't know about the commerce clause, but surely we're free to say maybe that's not a great idea because if it causes a lot of harm and it doesn't really reduce global temperatures very much. It just because comes something that um, causes more harm than good. Well, I think personal transportation is a pretty crucial factor when it comes to carbon emissions. Um, but you're right. Uh, you can't just today this wouldn't work. Uh, you need a situation where the technology is better, where the cars are a lot cheaper, uh, where the range is better. And in, and in particular, where you have basically you have an EV charging station in the future where you have gas stations today, where it's just that convenient. So that requires a lot of building out. Right. So, so because like, shouldn't we then, it wouldn't make more sense to like, if we're going to regulate EVs and things like that, we had the infrastructure has to reach that point. And I guess the other thing I'd be concerned about, so you're saying, okay, we need to transition by 2035, stop selling new gas cars. We got to get everyone to, to EVs by 2050. So that's going to increase the load on the electrical grid but we shouldn't have more fossil fuels. How do you do that? That seems impossible. Uh, no, I mean, I've listened to experts talk about this problem exactly. And yes, you're going to dramatically, you, you, with EVs, it means you're going to dramatically increase the amount of electricity generation. So, but that- You mean consumption. Consumption. Uh, but also gen you have to generate it from somehow. And that has to come from clean energy. So there will be, a massive increase in electricity, uh, not just EVs, but also in people's homes, we're going to have to gradually replace um, gas furnaces with heat pumps, um, which are just as efficient, by the way. So, but so you're saying, effort. so you're saying we need to, you do you want to make it illegal for people to have gas stoves and gas furnaces? No, I wouldn't say illegal. No. This is a silly debate. I would say at a certain point, you want to make sure that all new homes or apartments aren't, are not installed with gas furnaces. So it'd be illegal for a builder to install one of those things. Yeah. Yeah. That would be in line with the common good. Why not? Yeah. Well, okay. So if, if the U.S. Uh, got rid of all of its gas furnaces... No, 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 uh, not but, get rid of all gas furnaces, new buildings. You, you can't. You okay, yeah, it's fine. It implemented bans on gas furnaces, bans on gas cars. Uh, how much would that reduce global temperatures? Um, a significant amount, I would say. Like, if it's done globally, if it's done globally. No, no, I'm, I'm talking, we, we can only reduce, you know, the US is not king of the world, not yet at least. But for us, like what that would do that's an immense cost what you're saying to use like electric ranges which are four times more likely to injure someone than a gas range to use electric vehicles that lose 50 percent of their range in cold weather it'd be a very excessive cost and what i'm asking is what is the benefit how much would global temperatures go down if we as a country yeah. did that let me return that let me ask you a question here because i'm trying to well, figure out i would like you to answer mine then i'm happy to answer that yeah, I don't know the exact amount they would go down, but it, it requires global action, it would, especially in China. So you might say we should undertake this dramatic cost and it could have a negligible or no effect on global temperatures. I would not. I don't think that that will be the case. It will be part of the overall package of getting to net zero. Um, but my, that just, my question for you is, mm -hmm. where do you think we should go? When do you think we should reach zero emissions? Because I, I I say 2050, but I'm not exactly sure what, what your position is. Uh, I don't have a hard target date on that. I think that naturally, uh, as societies advance, as they become wealthier, people naturally desire cleaner forms of energy. So we saw that in England, for example, used to burn coal, for example, would be very dirty. But people preferred to live in a city with a, a coal-powered plant than just to burn wood in a stove in your home, for example. You see this in South Korea, Singapore. Uh, as countries become wealthier, 
they go through a phase where they go through dirty technologies and they get cleaner and cleaner. So I think we're on a natural progressive path towards cleaner energy. Uh, I wouldn't set a hard target date. I wouldn't be surprised if we are near carbon neutral by say like 2100, for example, or 2080. But I think that what we should focus on is adapting to climate change, that fossil fuels, it's true fossil fuels create problems, but we can also use fossil fuels to address fossil fuel problems like flood risks. We, that's why like floods, floods are bad in Bangladesh because they don't have flood control mechanisms. They're not bad here because we have reliable pumps and energy and dikes to be able to manage that. So I believe in the path, we will eventually probably get to carbon neutrality, but we should just allow innovation to grow on itself and focus on adaptation. Um, I agree with you on adaptation. But I would point out that adaptation is also extremely expensive. It requires a significant portion of global GDP to build the infrastructure that you agree is needed. Um, but I would disagree. I would say if we wait until 2100 to reach carbon neutrality, I think that's too late. I think that would push us past the, past the tipping points of warming, which leads to pretty bad consequences, especially for the global poor. Um, well, what's and for, for me, my my response to that would just be that there are a lot of these predictions about what things that will happen. And I look at the past post predictions of people say, oh, here's the negative things that are going to happen. The Maldives are going to be underwater. Uh, back in the 19, 1979, there was a environmentalist wrote the book, The Ark, saying a million species would be extinct by the year 2000. And there are these continual claims that are made, alarmist claims in many cases that don't end up coming to pass. So when I hear temperatures will increase, the IPCC says that, you know, at worst, we're going to experience people who are going to be richer than us now in the year 2100 will be, they'll be less rich. Like instead of having 3% economic growth by 2100, we'll have two and a half percent. Like I don't call that catastrophic. Well, I agree with you on one point, And that is that uh, as the climate scientist, very eminent climate scientist, Michael Mann points out, we have to fight the denialists, but we also have to fight the doomists, the people who believe that we're in a bad situation and there's nothing we can do to solve the problem. So doomism is a problem. I agree with you. And some of the, there are some extreme fringes of the environmental movement that make these doomist claims. Um, you know, my position is coming from the fact that it's very hard to predict the economic situation in 2100. I've given you some estimates of it but i think we can all agree that the people who are going to be hurt most are the poor it's the bottom billion um from they're already suffering from climate change and they will suffer more um, they live in regions that are most vulnerable to climate change they have less ability to adapt to climate change and their lifestyles are most likely to be wiped out from climate change so this is kind of what you know yeah. in terms of the preferential option for the poor this is one reason why I think we need to address it, you yeah. know, with some sense of urgency. Well, I wouldn't mind going, we've been going for a while. Maybe we can just go over to questions, but my, yeah, yeah, yeah. my final word on that before we close it all out would just be what hurts the poor the most in my perspective is not climate change. It is climate that you and I take for granted the ability to have lights, water, air conditioning, heat, refrigeration. Uh, and in many parts of the world, climate, there are most parts of the world today, like, in you know in minnesota or, or phoenix arizona lots of other places in other places all over the world where it's very very difficult or impossible just the regular old climate forgetting climate change but fossil fuels in the last 100 years have changed that and my concern is that with the preferential option of the poor in trying to especially inhibit fossil fuels we will unnecessarily promote human languishing instead of human flourishing but maybe we can go to questions yeah, I, I just want to say I disagree with that because sure. that is a, a position that's used by the fossil fuel industry, and I just think it's not right. Okay, let's go for questions. Sure. Now, what I'll do is uh, some of these questions are directed specifically to Trent and some directed specifically to Tony. So I'll ask those to you know whoever it's directed to, but of course the other can always offer some uh, thoughts at the end as well. So feel free to do that. <clears throat> First question is for you, Trent. Um, you said the deposit of faith extends to faith and morals, which excludes science. But aren't there various things that are that are scientific that must be believed? God creating us. 
Right. Well, there are some truths that are overlapping. Uh, so we have to say, what do we mean by science? So science is a way of cataloging, describing, testing the natural world and understanding how the natural world functions. Uh, so there are going to be scientific truths that overlap with truths of faith, uh, though I almost would just call them philosophical truths. Uh, like, for example, the fact that the natural world exists at all, uh, that this is not an illusion. I think that's a very basic scientific truth that there is a universe, there's matter, there's energy. Uh, so that's a scientific truth. And it's also a truth about faith that these things exist. They're not illusions. God, but that God created them. That's certainly not a scientific truth. That is a that's a theological or philosophical truth. So there are going to be scientific truths that inform things we believe about faith. Uh, but ultimately, the deposit of faith is related to things, uh, matters of faith that have been revealed by God, uh, or things that are necessary connections to that, like what the bishops have authoritatively taught, who who is an actual pope or ecumenical council, and then morals, which is not, which is related to the moral law to how we are to live. Now, there's going to be applications of that based on things like technology. So you have like IVF, uh, the apostles didn't know about in vitro fertilization but they did receive a deposit of faith about the nature of the human person and the conjugal union. And we would apply that to things like new technologies, but matters of prudence about what technologies to use to promote what kinds of flourishing, that'd be a prudential judgment. Tony, did you have a follow-up to that? Um, I would just, I'll just make one very quick point um, that, you know, obviously this is, we're talking about scientific reason and this has a moral dimension. So Laudato Si is really on, it basically, it takes the C Judge Act methodology and says the C is the scientific evidence, the solid scientific consensus that we have. And then we take that and we make a moral judgment about that. And that's there. That's part of the faith and morals, which I think is binding on Catholics. Uh, this one is for you, Tony. What are your predictions of the consequences of climate change if nothing is done by 2050? You know, that's I'm not I don't really like getting into the prediction game. If nothing is done by 2050, I would say that we're on track for warming in the range of 2.5 to 3 degrees. Um, that is not as bad as was expected maybe 15 years ago, but it's still pretty bad. We'll see more droughts. We'll see uh, maybe uh, crop yields in Africa down 20 to 30 percent, possibly. We'll see more severe weather events. We'll see more upheavals. We'll see more uh, climate migrants, which will put pressure on receiving countries and lead to kind of all kinds of political upheaval. So all these issues, I would, I would expect we'd see more wars and conflicts. Uh, like we're seeing in Nigeria right now, like we saw in Syria. So, yeah, these are the kind of things that I would think that we could possibly see in twenty by 2050. Uh, follow up for that, Trent? Yeah, what I would say is that when we <clears throat> make decisions about what actions to take, we always have to compare the consequences of acting and not acting. So I think in the climate change debate, we're, many times people only look at what are the consequences of not going carbon neutral by 2050. And you'll hear these reports, these predictions, often quite vague about what would happen in 2050, things like that. But then we have to compare it, okay, what would be the consequence of going carbon neutral? That we would have to spend trillions of dollars, tens of trillions of dollars that could be better spent eliminating global poverty, eliminating diseases like malaria. Uh, or seeing that in incorporating, sorry, I lost my I lost my train of thought. It's my kids were up last night. Uh, I would just say we have we have to compare the two separate things. Uh, and also, I would be concerned about saying, oh, look at like what happened in Syria. They had a drought and there was a civil war. Bad things that happen are multifaceted. And I find that climate change is often appended to many of them. Like I showed in my opening that droughts of the past hundred years, they have not increased. The IPCC does not see an increase in droughts in relation to climate change. In fact, the worst drought in history in Africa was in 1830, before the Industrial Revolution, Lake Baringo in Kenya completely dried up. And it was a horrible drought. And I mean, if you lived at that time, you probably were probably pretty dead or near dead. But it's because climate is weird. We, it, Mother Nature throws weird 
curveballs at us. But I would say fossil fuels give us the ability to knock the ball out of the park or at least not get hit in the head. Uh, Trent, there's a question for you here. Is there a danger of idolizing environmental concerns over spiritual matters? Can this ever border as a sin against the first commandment? Yeah, and if you look at Laudato Si, for example, Pope Francis puts forward a good uh, balance between two uh, negative approaches. So one approach, oh, who was it? Um, she was the woman, the female political commenter who actually thought Trump would get the nomination when nobody else did. I, I forget her name at, off the top of my head. It may have been her, but I've heard some political commentators say the earth take rape and pillage. You know, it's like, no, 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 no. As Catholics, we're called to be good stewards. We should watch consumption. Uh, we will have to make sacrifices for climate and environment, which is a common good. We should absolutely do that. That to idolize individual use would create an idol out of, you know, that the earth exists purely for our use. The church is very clear that. Uh, through the universal distribution of goods, the earth has been given to everyone to share. It's kind of like in an old, in a, in a Roman theater, a public theater. The theater is for everyone. You can have your seat that you own, but it, it's a good for the whole community. The earth is for everyone, not just for certain groups. But on the other hand, uh, you can idolize environments so much there are, and I'm glad Tony does not subscribe to this view. He would be with me and against them. There are some environmentalists who would say the best way to protect the climate is to simply get rid of human beings. And so they promote negative population growth, for example. They want to get rid of humans because they, they consider the, env the environment to be superior to human beings. Uh, so I think both of those would be the mis You can make idols out of either one. Tony, follow up? Follow up, I would say that in terms of sin, Pope Francis in Laudato Si does mention the idea of ecological sin, a term he borrows from Patriarch Bartholomew. So I think, you know, it's another example of how, you know, our decisions, he calls for an ecologi ecological conversion, uh, both individually and socially and institutionally. So, so, yeah, I think sin is an important issue when it comes to this. Uh, here's one for you, Tony. Since energy doesn't get created, how much making energy from sun or wind will remove that energy from the environment and have unexpected consequences? I'm not sure I understand that question. I'm a tad lost myself. Yeah, uh, okay. I don't understand. I, I honestly don't understand that question, Michael. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No. No problem. Let's let's move on to another one. Sorry about that, Mohoville. If you want to offer a follow up question, uh, let's see. Um, let me go back to the top here. I saw a good one over here. Um. Well, uh, this one is for you, Trant, but I'll come back with another one for Tony. Um, Trent followed from previous opponent. Uh, you must acknowledge the need to act quickly and effectively to reduce our impact on the planet. The West is very rich and can afford this. I'm not. Oh, okay, well, here's the first one. Cl climate change uh, aside, carbon emissions are intrinsically linked with economic expansion and inevitably the utter ecological destruction of the planet. Surely if you disagree with uh, with your followed, uh, with you must acknowledge that the need to act quickly and effectively to reduce our impact on the planet, the West is very rich and can afford this. Uh, yeah, I would just disagree with that. Michael, if you want to bring up my slide here, let's make sure, sure. we've... Uh... If, if that's up, uh, the the claim that, oh, well, becoming very rich causes ecological harm. I would say that as Western countries have grown richer, we have been able to preserve uh, different ecologies uh, that as you implement things like fossil fuels, that gives us machine energy. So people don't have to spend all of their time merely trying to have their basic needs met. Like in Africa, most people just in the poorest parts of Africa, they spend all of their time just trying they have subsistence level living they are just trying to not die they're just surviving so if you focus on just trying to survive you'll destroy the environment around you if the choice is between you dying and the environment you know suffering you're going to pick you uh so that you get things like inefficient slash and burn and things like that but when people say oh we're harming the environment you know in the past uh 60 years the number of designated protected areas in the world has uh, grown 25 times. Uh, so we're, there's more land now that has been protected. And by increasing the standard of living, you're able to do that. When it comes to harming the environment, well, 
okay, here's the thing. The environment does not have an intrinsic right to live like you or I. Like human beings have intrinsic rights and dignity. But when we act, we may cause harm to the environment. Like when you eat a cow, it's not great for the cow. It's good for you. Even if you eat a veggie burger, it's not great for the plant. It gets mulched up. It's not a plant anymore, but it's good for you. Uh, so there are going to be harms. Parts of the environment, other animals, minerals, vegetables, whatever, they'll be harmed. But the question is, are our actions good overall for everyone? And that's a prudential judgment people will make. But people will say things like, you know, they used to say, and actually climate change advocates the mo don't bring this up anymore. The polar bears that all oh, the polar bears are going to, you know, we're, we're destroying their ecosystem and they're starving. They don't have enough ice. Uh, but actually, polar bear populations have been pretty steady since like the 1980s. What helped polar bears uh, was just the ban on hunting them. Uh, so, you know, th so there's something, an intervention that can be helpful for the environment. You, know, you don't need to hunt polar bears unnecessarily. And we can, you can take it down, Michael, we can debate mm -hmm. those different policies, but just a blanket assertion, people growing rich are causing ecological crisis. They can do that, but that's not actually the general trajectory we see in the most developed countries in the world. Uh, follow up to that, Tony. Yeah, I am um, two points. Um, the first question is from a follow-up of something Trent said earlier. Um, yes, we want to eliminate extreme poverty. We want to fund healthcare, education, clean water and sanitation, clean energy, all that stuff. But we can do it. We can do this together. The best estimates suggest that that costs around three, three to four percent of global GDP, which is not a huge amount. We can do this. It's doable. Now, on this particular point about getting rich, um, yes, I think it's important. It's an interesting and instructive to compare the carbon footprint of the average American with the average European. The carbon footprint of the average American is 17 tons of CO2 per year. In Europe, it's about seven tons of CO2 per year. And the living standards are not that different. So it's definitely possible to have a high living standard and a much lower carbon footprint. All right. Last question for you, Tony. Um, if we stop producing fossil fuels, how do we empower farm, transportation, and heavy construction equipment? Well, I mean, this. there are areas where we have not worked out the technology yet. And I would say not so much these, but the real areas where we haven't worked it out are aviation, steel, cement, and chemicals, heavy industry. So we need to figure out, like, for example do advanced biofuels work, does clean hydrogen work. Um, we're seeing immense technological development in all these areas, but it hasn't fully been worked out yet. So I think we have, we do have some way to go, which is why, which is why I think Trent would agree with me here. I think that ending fossil fuels by 2030 is a, an unrealistic goal. Okay, Trent, follow up. Yeah, what I would say here, and if you, you go back to what I was showing you you guys earlier with like land use, for example, uh, I believe even going to 2050 is probably unsustainable. That uh, Now, I personally believe that, in contrast to Tony, that if we're going to in invest GDP in large sums of money, uh, we should be building as many nuclear reactors as we can. They are the safest form of energy uh, more people die from installing solar panels than from incidents involving nuclear reactors. Uh, they're incredibly efficient. They produce little waste that can be disposed of properly. What's amazing with nuclear is that Pope Francis wants to reduce nuclear stockpiles around the world. And I agree we should do that. Uh, and a good way to reduce nuclear stockpiles, they have that nuclear fuel in the bombs. You could put it in a nuclear power plant to use it as fuel. It's amazing. Uh, but otherwise, uh, that's going to take decades upon decades to build. But the infrastructure that we have now, I feel like all that is going to end up happening, just to be just frankly honest, is if we're going to do policies that are rushed and alarmist, and then later people will realize they didn't amount to good and people will refuse to apologize for them, like banning new gas stoves, uh, you know, trying to make everything wind and solar. What it reminds me of is like during COVID when we required, we had all of these stupid rules that came out of alarmism. Uh, you have to have the plastic dividers by your restaurant booth. You couldn't touch a menu. You have to have QR codes. When I went to my office at Catholic Answers, we had to have tape on the ground with arrows so you don't pass by other people. 
Uh, we did all of these things, mask mandates, and that you know the two year olds can't go on a plane to, to their mo their grandmother's funeral because they can't wear a mask, uh, even though the who didn't recognize you know all this stuff. We're going to do all these policies. It'll come to pass to realize, oh, maybe that actually wasn't really worthwhile, and nobody's going to apologize for it. They'll declare an amnesty on the climate change proposals we hastily adopted, just like people want an amnesty on the COVID protocols that actually were foolish. That's what I think would probably happen. And I, sorry, I don't mean to get testy about it, but I want to call people out for it now before it ends up happening. All right. So let's move to the last part here, our closing thoughts. So beginning with you, Tony, go ahead and take a few minutes here to offer any concluding thoughts that you have. Sure. I mean, I guess I would argue that I got to repeat by saying that we as Catholics need to rally around the vision of Pope Francis in Laudato Si, which is uh, shows very clearly he analyzes and analyzes the scientific consensus of the environmental crisis. It makes the moral diagnosis and then asks, spells out in very specific terms what we need to do as individuals and societies to do to deal with that. And that in particular revolves around the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, which was negotiated by nearly every country in the world in 2015 and is a lays out the contours of the global common good, at least in the environmental uh, dimension. Um, Trent mentioned COVID. Um, I agree with him that some of these protocols were a little on the silly side, but let's not forget that COVID killed 1.1 million Americans and 18 million people worldwide. This was the most devastating pandemic in a century. So it made a lot of sense for the governments to come in with rules and regulations to deal with that. Now, in retrospect, were some of those rules a little on the silly side? Yes, they were. But had people lived up to rules better and instead of getting into silly conspiracy theories and politicizing things, we could have saved countless lives from dying of COVID. Uh, I would not regard the requirements of the Paris Agreement on climate change as... Um, as uh, hysterical or as absurd or as, uh, as silly. I think that they reflect the best wisdom that the world has today on offer. Um, it's no surprise that all of the religions of the world cohere on the need to address the environmental crisis. They, re they recognize it as one of the grave challenges we face today. And we need to rally around the global common good uh, as encapsulated by the Paris Agreement on climate change. And if that means that we have to take some decisions that some people don't like or they regard as an infringement of their personal liberties, well, that's what the global common good is all about at the end of the day. All right. So, Trent, concluding thoughts. Yeah, I guess I'm going to continue jumping off the, the COVID parallel here because I see a lot of parallels where... Uh, there might be three views with COVID, uh, complete, absolute denial, the disease even exists or is serious at all, uh, over concern about the disease and alarmism, and then a kind of realism towards COVID that, yes, this is a serious disease for a particular population, uh, and we should take moderate steps to address it, like uh, protecting people in nursing homes instead of sending COVID infected people to nursing homes has happened in places like New York and things like that. Uh, but it's just funny what Tony was saying, like, oh, these conspiracy theories, themes that uh, derail us. What I worry about in the climate change debate. So there's like these three views, right? Uh, one view is that all of climate change is a hoax. I don't have that view. Tony doesn't have that view. Tony has a view that I would say is overly urgent and does not need to be. Mine would be more of a realist view of then. So, so going back to COVID then. Uh, I think that what ended up helping us in the COVID crisis was the ingenuity and innovation of pharmaceutical companies that were able to create a vaccine uh, faster than any other. There were ethical issues with it. But fortunately, there are actually other companies now that have created um, more ethical vaccines in relation to that. 
But we we that when government meddled, there was this cry, oh, follow the science, follow the science. There is no such thing as the science. Uh, there are scientists. There was the Great Barrington Declaration that said lockdowns were essentially not helpful. And these were called fringe scientists. They turned out to be right. Like Sweden was vindicated in their approach, for example. And we're told, oh, you you just had these silly conspiracy theories that derail the conversation, like the theory that COVID-19 was from a lab leak in Wuhan. At the beginning of the pandemic, you were censored online for saying that. And now that's accepted as a fact. Constantly, we're seeing the experts getting things wrong and wrong and wrong. Experts do get things right sometimes, sure. But I don't like the idea of a tyranny of experts that we have to submit to, even if a bishop or the bishop of Rome places an in inordinate amount of trust in their predictions. So um, that's why I think that what we should do, following what the church teaches, uh, Tony quoted a cardinal, I'll quote a cardinal uh, myself, actually, Gerhard Muller, who said, environmental policy has nothing to do with faith and morals. Those issues are for politicians and for people to vote for the party they, they agree with. We should care for the environment uh, and we should debate and we should be free to discuss what things are most or least effective. And we should be wary about those who say, we don't have time for debate. We have to just act. Could you bring up a slide, please, Michael? This will be my last slide. This is a quote from Steven Schneider. He, is, he was the founder of the Climatic Change Journal, Stanford climatologist, well-respected. He said this back in 1989 to Discover Magazine. He said, we need to get some broad-based support to capture the public's imagination. That, of course, means getting loads of media coverage. So we have to offer up scary scenarios, make simplified dramatic statements, and make little mention of any doubts we might have. This double ethical bind we frequently find ourselves in cannot be solved by any formula. Each of us has to decide what the right balance is between being effective and being honest. I hope that means being both. Uh, but here even, you can bring that down. Schneider is saying, and we see this among climatologists who promote more urgent action, a need more to scare people than to soberly address the facts. I think that we should just look at the facts as they are and pick the most feasible paths forward that will promote the most human flourishing, especially those who don't live in fossil fuel countries, who don't have the leisure, who can't watch this debate right now on a computer that struggle to learn about the world by candlelight. Let's do our best to help the whole human community, give respectful consideration to what the Pope has said, but be good stewards of the environment and good brothers and sisters to one another across the world. Gentlemen, I want to thank both of you for coming on and offering your positions in this wonderful dialogue. I also want to give you each an opportunity to uh, put in the plug for anything you're working on or ways that you want the audience to um, maybe reach out to you or just things you want to point them to. Tony, beginning with you, put in a plug. Uh, where can people reach you on social media, stuff like that? Oh, they can find me on Twitter at Tony Annette. It's my name. And... Um... If you want to read me, um, check out my book, Cathonomics, How Catholic Tradition Can Create a More Just Economy, published by Georgetown University Press last year. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on. Trent? Yes, I'd recommend uh, going to my podcast, The Council of Trent, C-O-U-N-S-E-L, of course, on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play. I have a website, trenthorn.com. Uh, books you can find at a Catholic bookstore near you, but check out my podcast, The Council of Trent. Wonderful. Once again, thank y'all both for coming on for this very, very interesting discussion. And everybody, thank y'all for watching and for your participation. Hit the like button and the subscribe button. Share this on your social media. That's going to do it. We'll see you later. God bless.